Welcome to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. When you're ready to transform your sales for today's transforming market, we've got you covered with your host, the queen of cold calling and founder of Salesology, award-winning author, speaker, sales trainer, and coach, Wendy Weiss. Hi, welcome to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. And I'm your host, Wendy Weiss. I'm the founder of Salesology and the Salesology Prospecting Method, and I'm also known as the queen of cold calling. Today, our very special guest is Bill Hellcamp. Uh, his company is Reach Development Systems. And uh, Bill has dedicated the past 30 years to helping professionals maximize their capabilities. He's a noted facilitator, executive coach, and speaker, and he's able to captivate audiences with his entertaining and insightful perspective on individual and team development. And through his interactive activities and thoughtful questionings, He's able to increase participants' awareness of where they need to grow. And then he gives some practical tools to accomplish that evolution. He's published hundreds of motivating articles and videos, and uh, you can access them on his website, which is reachdev.com. And of course, we're going to post that in the show notes. Um, and welcome. Welcome, Bill. Well, thanks, Wendy. It's really good to be here. Yeah, I'm so happy that you are here today. And yeah. my my first question for you, uh, let's begin where we often begin. Um, how did you become a noted facilitator, executive coach, <laughs> and speaker? What is the backstory here? Usually it's by accident, isn't it, uh, that uh, we tend to go for things in life. But uh, yeah, I in college, I was in sales in a retail store where we actually were commissioned. So unless, unlike most retail stores today, even, even the electronic stores, which used to all be commissioned, I was commissioned and I became a manager, ended up moving up to Minneapolis uh, to get a new store up here and then didn't enjoy it anymore. So I went into uh, advertising sales as an account manager. I enjoyed that, but I hadn't done business to business sales, obviously in retail, I hadn't done a lot of business. That was a big change, I think, to move from the retail environment where people come to you to an environment where people go out. But during my time with that retail store, I took a course called the Dale Carnegie course. And it really revolutionized some things in my life based on where I came from. And I, when I finished at advertising, I thought, what do I want to do now? And I went to the local Dale Carnegie office and I said, will you hire me? And they said, well, we don't hire instructors. I wanted to be an instructor. And they said, we don't hire instructors, we hire salespeople and some of them instruct. So I started selling for Dale Carnegie and I cut my teeth learning how to teach their methods. And I really enjoyed that part. But like any big corporation, it wasn't able to, we weren't able to um, to customize things for customers. We had kind of the six courses. And if, you're, if your problems fit into one of those six courses, then we could sell you something. So I said, I want to be able to customize and consult and do a lot more for customers. So after about six years of learning from them, a very good company, I went out on my own. And that was almost 30 years ago. So uh, I started to uh, to customize things and develop programs. And I, I think of my company as a boutique um, where customers can come in and tell me what they need and I can develop programs that are going to best fit their needs. Hey, I love that. So you're not doing cookie cutter. You're developing programs for folks as they need them. Yeah, well, there's forms, right? There's there's things that we do, things that we know that we can use over and over again. But how we put those together and how we develop them to meet that customer's needs most quickly, right? If 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 prospecting is a big part of it, then we need to spend more time there than maybe we do on some other parts of the sales process. And and some of the things that they need help with might be might be improving their process and some things they might need help with could be 
attitude or even how they they look at sales from a from an institutional standpoint. I know I'm working with one client now and we're dealing with the the financial people and the financial people don't think selling is worth much, but the sales people think sales is worth a lot and so there's conflict. So you have to help them deal with that. Absolutely. So I'm curious about something um as I was introducing you. Uh your your bio says that you're able to increase participants' awareness of where they need to grow. Mm -hmm. And I always find that to be uh, very interesting because sometimes the things that people think they need is not exactly what they need. Mm. So could you talk a little bit about that and how you do um, increase someone's awareness of where well, they I need to one, grow? Yeah, I think one of the first things a good instructor does is they help people assess themselves and they don't go into an instructional process and which I have in the past. I'll tell you a story about that, but we go into an instructional process thinking we know everything because we talk to maybe the owner or the sales manager. And, and then we start running right into what our, what our presentation is. And, and if we're aware, we see people kind of shaking their heads or looking at us like we're crazy and we know we didn't do enough assessment either before the training or at the beginning of the training for the people to get the buy-in. Because just because someone's at our training program doesn't mean they bought into the idea that they need to even be trained. They might think, huh, I'm pretty good at what I do, or this guy has nothing to tell me, or this, this woman doesn't really reflect what I need. And so we have to do some things early on in any program to get them to buy in. So let me tell you a quick story of a, a thing that happened to me. I was I was called in by the leasing, the VP of leasing at a at a large company, and he said, My people, they they collapse when in negotiations. Anytime that we're trying to to maintain the lease price or the lease uh, percentage, they fall all over themselves to give the customer everything they want. So based on this, I developed a negotiation course and I went in there and I started teaching it to these 20 people who were who were leasing experts and they all looked at me like I was nuts. And finally, after about half a day of it or you know half of a half a day, I said, wait a minute, this isn't going well. Tell me what the real problem is. And they said, we don't fall all over ourselves to drop the price. Our vice president falls all over himself to drop the price. So if our customers call him, he'll always give them a lower price. So we decided as a group to quit letting him be the hero. And we decided we wanted to be the hero with the customers. And we gave them the best price right away. And now he's he's thinking that we're we're not doing our job. But that that's the, some of the things that can happen when you get into the training room. If you haven't done the right amount of work beforehand to find out what's really going on, in that case, I found out that I better go and talk to the the sales leader. And then I went and talked to the sales leader and I told him what they said and he fired me. So, uh, you know, <laughs> he didn't want to hear what the truth was or at least what his troops felt. So um, I, I, I did other work with that company, but not with him anymore. So. So what happens when your assessment, uh, the, the feedback that you're getting from the participants in your program before you start doing the training piece, mm -hmm. um, what if their assessment is different from, uh, is, a, is a disconnect from what they actually need? Does that ever happen? Well, it did in that case, obviously, which, which yeah. poses your question. So I learned from that that I don't just interview the managers. I started to interview uh, pre pre class or as I am designing a program or customizing a program, I started talking to a number of the people that were going to be participating, some of what we might call influencers. And there's two benefits out of that. One benefit is that I learn more. I might learn if I'm being um, taken taken for a ride by the by the boss a little bit as I was in the story that I told you. But even if I'm not, if they're aligned, if they're telling me the same story, I get a lot of buy-in from those influencers early. And what the story that goes around the organization is, hey, the, the guy who's going to teach the class, he came in and talked to us and he found out about what our needs were. So this should be a better class because it wasn't just what the company wanted us to have. He said he's going to integrate what we have. And I do that. I take the information that they have and I integrate it into the program so that 
so that we're hitting a wider swath. Then another thing that I do early on in the training is I talk about what we're going to cover and how they feel about it. And I cover some of the subjects and we we put check marks by it and say, okay, how important is this to you? And then, and we'll, we'll put a number and we'll, it kind of weights what the importance is. And that tells me even during the program, how much more time to spend if it's perhaps in discovery, I might spend more time there if that's a problem or more time in uh, uh, approaching new customers. So we can weight it a little bit, even based on what they say. And then I take that same sheet of paper that we used at the beginning to say, what's important to you? And at the very end, we'll take that sheet of paper and I'll go over that and I'll say, now, did we cover this well enough for you? Did you get what you needed out of these areas where you have a number of check marks, which says that the audience weighted those heavier. So I think it's important uh, from a success standpoint to to really look at what people want, not just the managers, but but the whole team wants and needs, and then help them get that during the class. And so that's how I not only customize it beforehand, but even customize it as I'm teaching with the amount of time that we might spend waited. And then we go back and check to make sure they were satisfied. Okay. So I'm curious, I mean, one of the the things that I think about a lot, uh, you may or may not uh, know this, Bill, and our audience. My first career was I was a dancer. I was a ballet dancer. And uh, when you give direction to a ballet dancer, the choreographer gives direction, the teacher gives direction, the dancer just goes and does it. Mm-hmm. They, they, you might ask a question if, it, if the direction is not clear. Right. But there is no, well, I can't do that. That won't work for me. What I'm doing is different. There's there's none of that. So I have often uh, puzzled over early in my career when I started my, my company, when we started Salesology, uh, working with adults. And I was uh, looking, poking around your website. And you talked a lot about working with uh, adult learners. Yep. And so... It seems to me that what you, this process that you've described would go a long way towards helping that I can't do that, that won't work for me mm-hmm. uh, type of interaction. Yeah, adult learners are, well, I, I, my, my theory is adult learners are smart and they're capable and they know things. And if you will talk to them uh, as adults and engage them so that their ideas come out, not only do you have a better class, a better situation, but you learn things too that you should be able to, if you have some experience, adapt into the program and start to use, maybe it's just terminology. You know, you've probably found this like I have. Sometimes if I use the term wrong terminology for a customer instead of a client, or or I talk about something in the wrong way, people will 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 say, you don't you must not know our company because you're just using some of the wrong language. So integrating their own language and listening to them. And that's why I do a lot of interviews before I I will train an organization, because I want to not only learn what their needs are, but in some ways what their language is, what they call customers, what's important to them, how they book business, how the sales process works currently. All those things are important that you don't get up there. I, I, I don't want to be some kind of overwhelming expert or pretend expert that I know everything. One of the things I'll say early in in most programs is I know how to sell things, but you know your company better than I do. So my job here in front of you for the next day or two days or three days, whatever the timing is, is to integrate both of our levels of knowledge. So I can take the things in, in the way that I know that selling works better and integrate them with the needs and issues that you have. So even during the training, I'm still talking to them actively about integrating because as you know getting that buy-in from them that says this is valuable to me this is worth it even if i don't understand everything the first time this person's trying to get through to me a new idea uh then your class is going to go much better and people are going to be much more involved and i think that it's that involvement it's not just from me to you it's from you to me and us as a group and how can we integrate all this information Absolutely. If you don't have people that are involved, then much as you might want to, you can't really help them. And it starts right from the beginning. I Very early in my career, one of my first uh, training engagements, I had the um, manager come in and introduce me. He, and he essentially said, 
none of you are selling, so she's here to fix that. Right, right. And, yeah, and yeah. it went the and remedial it went, program. <laughs> it, it went downhill from there. <laughs> yeah, it got, yeah, I didn't think it could get worse, but it did. <laughs> it did. It did. <laughs> oh, you're absolutely right. That that the the introduction can tell you a lot about the attitude the, uh, of people. Um, uh, Scott Plum and I, who do a podcast together, and Wendy, you're going to be on our podcast, which we're Absolutely. very excited about, the uh, Winning at Selling podcast. We're reading a book right now called The Theory of Accountability, and one of the mindsets is is thinking about how we think about people. Do we think about people as tools that we're trying to use, or do we think about people as intelligent adults who we want to work with and 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 we value what they bring to the table? And in your case with the boss, he he didn't really value what those people had to bring. It was just basically fix these idiots for me. And and if that's the attitude, and we find out about that beforehand, you neither you nor I would probably go into that situation knowingly, knowing that that's their <laughs> attitude about these people. Yes. Well, um, what I learned from that all those years ago uh, was one. You're right. He didn't really value his salespeople, but he didn't really value me either. Mm, and mm -hmm. so that you want to be the smartest person in the room right right yeah. and uh so that uh, i think you become the smartest person in the room by letting other people be smart too <laughs> and um yep. yeah you let them show their smarts and then they're they're grateful you know I, when i i do teach a course on on how to instruct and one of the things i i tell people is most of your problems with your classes are self-inflicted wounds the way you treat them, the way you talk to them, the way you you navigate your course, and whether you listen to them, it, it, it's your problem. It's not their problem. If they're inattentive, that's your problem. How are you delivering the material? If they're talking in the back, you're boring. You're boring them. It, you know, they're not coming into a class going, let's see if we can destroy this class for this person. They're coming in saying, well, if, if it works out, that's good. We'll see what happens. And if you bore them, they're going to start talking in the back corner or playing solitaire on their laptops. So watch how you watch your reaction and assume you're the problem. And so that you can fix that connection that you're making with them. My, my children have all obviously gone through school and quite often they would say, everyone failed the test. So the professor's mad at us. And, and I'm thinking if everyone fails the test, the professor ought to be mad at the professor because they didn't teach it right. If one person fails the test, that might be that individual's fault. If everyone's failing, it sounds like it's an instructional problem, but people don't look at it that way. Yeah, they, uh, lots of times I will speak with prospects or clients and they will, they'll say, nobody's selling, nobody's prospecting, mm -hmm. nobody's building a pipeline. And the truth is if you've got a sales team and nobody's prospecting and nobody's selling, it's not them, it's you. Yeah, what are you doing to motivate them one yeah. way or the other? Yeah, yeah, or and give them the tools that they need so that they could be successful because motivation alone is not going to cut it right. if you don't know right. what you're doing. Well, Scott and I laugh all the time. You know, what are the sales goals this year? 10% more than you did last year. Oh, okay. So was I 10% lazy last year? Is that what you're assuming? I didn't work. I only worked 90%. You just throw this sales goal out me at me that's 10% more. And as you say, what are the new tools that you're going to give me so I can achieve that 10%? Are we going to have a 10% price increase? Are we going to have 10% new product? Are you going to give me 10% more leads? How is this going to happen? Because I'm assuming I worked full time last year. Or maybe you're going to get more vacation this year. Who knows? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, we're going to pause here for a moment for a word from our sponsor. And when we come back, uh, Bill, I want to ask you some questions about training versus coaching. And also, let's talk a little bit about discovery. Uh, because that I... I see a lot of uh, people falling down on the job when it comes to discovery, and I know that's one of your uh, favorite topics as well. So, it is. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, But we're going to pause now for a word from our sponsor, Salesology 3X Appointments. You know how frustrating and stressful it is when you leave every sales meeting wondering if your sales team knows how to sell because they're not selling and all you ever hear from them are excuses. 
They blame your marketing. They say you need to do more social media. And they say you need a new website. You know something's wrong. You don't quite know what it is. And you're even starting to wonder if it's you. You don't have a lot of options. You could fire them all and start from scratch. That would be expensive. And you're really sick of waking up in the middle of the night wondering how to fix this. Well, imagine instead that you have an easy to use replicable system that ensures that your team can easily schedule qualified appointments. And imagine that your team is excited and motivated. No more excuses. And you feel good. Salesology 3X appointments can make that happen. If you're a business owner or a sales manager with an underperforming sales team, let's talk. Click on the link to my calendar in the show notes, schedule a time, and I look forward to meeting you. And we are back with Bill Hellcamp, whose company is Reach Development Systems, and we're tra- we're talking about training and coaching. Right. And Bill, what's what's the difference? Well, coaching um, is a much more personalized process where it's not just about here's something that you need to know and I'm going to deliver this information to you. Uh, What I'm trying to do more and more with my programs is to incorporate both training and coaching. The training is, is here's the new ideas that you can use and we'll practice those so you develop some level of skill with them. Uh, one step back from that is education. So education is here's the new information and and you should learn that and know it. And you're, it's up to you whether you're going to do something different. I'm a trainer. My job is to help you get better at doing something. So we need to actively try things out and 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 work together to get better at it before the training is over. Coaching then can take that training longer term and help you integrate that those new ideas into what you're doing. Uh, something that I'm sure you found, just because I sell a training program and deliver a training program doesn't mean that the sales manager is going to do anything different as a result of that. And we need to teach the sales managers over time how to integrate the new information. If it's more phone calling, not only do do they need to stand behind them with their whip and say, sell more, coach more, train more, you know, right? Uh, uh, Right. make more phone calls, but they need to stand next to them and say, let me listen to your phone call. Let me help you make that a little bit better each time. You know, we tend to practice on customers all the time instead of practicing on each other. There's not enough sales teams that get together for an hour a week and just practice phone calls, just practice their discovery, practice their their interaction with a client practice how they're going to say something. And so instead of practicing on each other, we practice on clients and we never know if we get better or not because they're not going to give us feedback. Their only feedback is, well, you know, I'll think about it or no, thank you. So the coaching allows us to interact with the leadership over a long period of time, helping them to integrate the new material and work together with their, their, uh, their team they're often as confused by the new material as their team is. Just because they thought it was a good idea doesn't mean they know how to integrate it or how to use it themselves. So we need some time together after the training to be able to work together to figure out how is this how is this material really going to work within my company on a day-to-day basis. And that's what we try to do with the coaching. Yeah, we do all of our programs. They're six months or they're a year because... Um, again, early when I started my company, all those years ago, I thought if I just told people what to do, Mm -hmm. they'd be able to do it. Right. right. And I was really surprised to find out that wasn't true. Yeah. And, um, (laughs) so, you know, we work with people over time because it, you know, realistically it takes time to develop new skills and put them into practice and get comfortable and be, become effective. Uh, yeah, you'll find uh, on my uh, site, if you'll poke around a little bit, a thing called the cycle of self-development. And and I learned that a number of years ago is the first thing we need to do is have a good attitude about I can make a change. You know, some people go into training thinking, this is the way I am. You can't change me. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. So you have to overcome those attitudes and help them feel that they can learn and that there is value to learning. Then you can give them some information or knowledge 
And then they have to take that knowledge out and do something with it and try it. And then if it works, oh my gosh, then people become excited about getting new information and trying it. But so often they've gotten information that isn't good. They never try it. It doesn't work. I call it the really good binder shelf. We, we all have a, a very nice binder shelf in our office with all the old training programs we've been through and never looked at again. Uh, so I don't want my binder that says reach development systems on the edge of it to be just a nice binder that we've never looked at. I want it to be a, a training tool, a, a working tool that says, oh, man, I, I didn't like that phone call. Let me go back and look at what Bill and I worked on together and see if we can come up with something better. Absolutely. Um, so let's switch gears here a little bit and talk about discovery because uh, you and I were chatting before the show and mm -hmm. you, you, you told me this is one of your favorite topics and it's actually one of my favorite topics as well. So I want to make sure that we have a chance to talk about it. Um, what do you see as the do's and the don'ts Okay. About right. discovery calls. Well, let, let me tell you a story. Like I love to tell stories, so you'll have to get used to this. Anyway, uh, my son had graduated from college as an accountant, and I had a friend of mine who was a HR manager at a large accounting firm in town. And I said, why don't you go and meet with Katie? And, and we got the appointment, and he said, fine. I said, now, the night before, I said, now, let's sit down. I want you to write out 10 questions that you want to ask her. And, I, and he said, oh, She's going to ask me questions. She's doing the interviewing. I said, I know, I know, but we'll work with your dad. I know I'm kind of stupid, but let's work together on this. So we came up with a list of 10 questions. We typed them up. We put them on a piece of paper, and he went to the interview. And when he came home, I said, how was it? And he grunted at me as a teenager would. And, well, I guess he's 20, in his 20s by then, but he's still grunting. And so I called Katie, and I said, how did it go? She said, oh, he was so delightful. And she said, but the most impressive thing was he had 10 questions written down to ask me. And it just showed me that he was really prepared for the interview. So even in anything that we do, preparation shows in what we do. And if I'm going to go have an interview with a customer, I have a, a database of hundreds of questions uh, in different categories that I start writing down. I start cutting and pasting onto a document because that's what I'm going to spend my time with. I want to ask some questions. And you know, Wendy, when I'm in with that customer, they just, those good questions just aren't going to miraculously come into my head. So if I have prepared some really good questions, then I can ask them really good questions. If I don't prepare them, I'm, I'm going to ask them the same old thing over that everyone else is asking them. So those questions, that discovery and where it leads, obviously, there's many more questions than the 10. Those are just starter questions. But those lead me into very good areas to help find out what the real challenge is. If I don't spend time discovering, if if a salesperson doesn't spend time discovering, they're going to they're gonna either sell them what they have, sell them what they like, or sell them what they think they will like. And, and the problem, and I, I do this on every, almost every class where I have discovery taught, we'll do a, a we'll prep, we'll prepare questions, and then we'll do a practice session in the class of discovery. And almost invariably, I'll sit and listen in, they'll ask three questions, the, the pretend customer will give them a little bit of information, and they'll start selling to that. Well, let me tell you what we have. And and instead of saying, well, tell me more about that, or why is that a problem, or why is that a challenge, or what else does that, instead of really driving into that question and trying to find more things, uh, they'll just start selling. And what I say that happens to them is they get the small sale, but they miss the huge problem underneath. They get the surface information but they miss the big things that they could get. Uh, if it's, you know, one of my customers was a, was a safety, they sold safety equipment. And what I would laugh and say is you're going to get the gloves, but you're never going to get the entire alarm system for the company. You'll sell the, you'll sell the 20 cent product, but you'll miss the $20,000 deal because you're going to start selling too soon. So good discovery preparation is key and very few salespeople do it. Very few salespeople know what questions they want to ask beyond the first two. And then they let the customer guide the sale and they guide it toward whatever their just most pressing need is at the moment, but not the big deal that could be lurking behind. Maybe the small sale is all there is. That could be true. But often I find there's a bigger deal lurking behind 
if we'll really do good discovery. So prepare, have good questions to ask, and then take some time to practice. Again, as we don't practice on that that million dollar customer, practice on another salesperson, see how it goes, and you'll by verbalizing the things that are going on in your mind, you'll find out that you could do it a better way. Absolutely, you know. Uh, when you're a ballet dancer, you don't just run out on stage and start dancing. Mm-hmm. You've been practicing uh, for months. And yeah. uh, say, same thing here. And uh, I was watching an interview with a football player. You know, you've watched these uh, these uh, wide receivers make these one-handed catches, falling out of bounds and tapping their other toe right inside the line to to make a touchdown or a long pass. And you think, my gosh, that's miraculous. And I, I listened to this uh, this uh, receiver, and he said, oh, no, he said, I practice that 200 times a day. I practice it 200 times to the left. I practice it 200 times to the right. I practice it 200 times running from the left, 200 times running. And he says, I just have a guy there with me all day, and I'm making one-handed catch after one-handed catch after one-handed catch. That's not the first time that that wide receiver has made a one-handed catch. He's made thousands of them in practice so that when that opportunity arises and he has to catch it with one hand, he's got the skill set there. But we're professional salespeople, so we we'll just try it once on our customer and see what happens. And then our uh, and then our boss says, "How did your sale go?" And he goes, "Ah, he didn't need anything." And we we don't learn anything from it either. So right. this is a profession. It's not a it's not a practice session. Just like your ballet example. Yeah, uh, the great Russian ballerina Anna Pavlova said. Uh, no one arrives from talent alone. Work transforms talent into genius. Mm-hmm. I can't remember who said it, but uh, a similar quote is, uh, uh, hard work beats talent when talent won't work hard. I so, like that one too. Yeah, they're both yeah, good, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. So it's, we, and I think uh, I, I'm, a, I'm an instructor for um, John Maxwell's material, and he has a book called Talent is Never Enough. So never enough. Got, never enough you've got it you've got to use that talent right yeah so So i'm curious if you see because this is something that i i see a lot uh with with clients uh and during this discovery process after the fact in a coaching call how did your you know how did your meeting with the prospect go you know what did they say and they'll my client will say something oh the, the prospect said this and I'll say, well, what exactly did she mean by that? And they'll say to me, oh, well, she probably meant. <laughs> and, and and they go they go through. It's, it's a mind reading process mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. the, the mind reading that salespeople do is astonishing. It's phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah. It is astonishing. Yeah. I think the most important questions are the short ones. Hmm. Really? Tell me more. How do you mean that? Where would you use that? And and it's those little follow-up questions. Those aren't ones that I've written down, but they're the ones that the big questions guide me to. And you get a question that you don't really understand the answer to. You can't nod sagely and act like you do. You say, really? How does that work? What would you do? How? What would you do different if you had it all to do over again? Just great little questions like that that you that make it a conversation. And I think one of the most important things for a salesperson, and this is where I think a lot of them fall down, they're not curious enough. They don't ask. I wonder questions enough. I wonder about your company. I wonder about you. I wonder about your needs. I wonder about your issues. I really want to know them. I'm really curious. One of the most wonderful things about consulting is how many different kinds of companies I get to work with. And I learn about dry food packaging, and I learn about making industrial screens, and I learn about healthcare laundry services. And there are things that I didn't know, but I'm just fascinated by how they work and and how you make a business out of that. And, And salespeople are just thinking, too many salespeople are just thinking, I wonder if I can sell them another widget. Yeah. Instead of thinking, what? how can we integrate ourselves together and help each other? Yeah, and I think also sometimes salespeople are afraid of uh, looking stupid. If they ask a question, uh, they they think they should know everything. But of course you can't know everything. So go ahead and ask the question. And 
the pro your prospects aren't going to think you're stupid. They're going to think you're a genius because you're asking great questions and and oh. engaging them. Well, how many questions? How many how many conversations have you gotten out of where you never said anything? You just asked questions and nodded, and they said, "Oh, that Wendy, she's a great conversationalist." Absolutely. Like, well, I'm a great questioner <laughs> and listener. Yeah. So, um, Bill, this is this has been a, a great interview. Would you put your hand over your heart and promise me that you'll come back so we can do it again? Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. We only we barely scratched the surface barely on scr all these fascinating materials. So. Uh, that is true. So, till you come back next time, where can people find you? If people want well, more uh, information, sure. Well, I love to connect on LinkedIn. So uh, you can go to my LinkedIn, and and uh, I don't think there's a lot of hell camps are out out there. So Wendy will have my name on her uh, on her show page, and you can just uh, go there. Uh, you can go to winningatselling.com, which is the podcast that I do with Professor Plum, and we've got over 200 shows of winningatselling.com. And then you can go to my website, reachdev.com. It's short for Reach Development Systems, so Reach Dev. And I've got hundreds of articles and and uh, uh, videos that I do. I do a little video called the two minute selling tips and those are fun. So I put a lot of information out there that people can learn more about me or about what they want to do, uh, what they want to learn in sales. Yes. And we're going to put all of those links, uh, the Bill's LinkedIn uh, profile, his website, the winning and selling podcast. It's all going to be in the show notes. So as soon as you finish listening to this podcast, Go and click on the links, connect with Bill on LinkedIn, listen to Winning and Selling, and uh, definitely go to reachdev.com, uh, watch some of the videos, read some of the articles. It's all great stuff. And well, Wendy, uh, this has just been a joy for me to be with you today. What a great conversation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you to all of our listeners today. You have been listening to the Salesology Conversations with Sales Leaders podcast. And I've been talking to Bill Hellcamp, who is, and his company has reached development systems. And if you found value in today's podcast, then think of one business owner or one sales professional, one entrepreneur, someone that you know that you think might also find value in listening to this podcast, and please do share the link with them. And till we meet again, visualize yourself surrounded by cash, really large bills. You've been listening to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. Be sure to follow so that you don't miss a single episode. And while you're at it, please leave a rating and review and be sure to share it with your friends. Tune in every week for more exciting insights and wisdom on transforming sales. And until next time, visualize yourself surrounded by cash. Very large bills. Mm -hmm.